Hi, everyone. This is Tim Womack, Senior Pastor, First Presbyterian Church. And if you're receiving this um, video or uh, viewing it, probably means you are an elder or a deacon actively in our congregation. So what we are trying to do this year, 2022, is to send you a variety of videos and a variety of links to some training opportunities for officers. It's still a little difficult for us to get together for training events. So uh, we're trying to do it this way. We hope it's helpful. So Michael and I will do a couple of sessions. And then the third session, we're going to have a question and answer time and try to get uh, the deacons and the elders together on a Zoom call just to see if there are any questions in regard to leadership, where we are as a church, or anything you want to talk about. So that's kind of what's going on with us right now. And so this is the first session. We're going to have these three. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the nuts and bolts of who we are. It's just kind of the straightforward, uh, how does it work being an elder, uh, particularly, and a deacon uh, as well. But what I have found over the years is we do training and we talk about deep theological thoughts. We talk about biblical principles, and sometimes we neglect the most basic elements of being an officer, when our meetings are, who's serving where, uh, how we're structured, how your uh, reports get up to session level. So we're going to make sure that we get these nuts and bolts taken care of very quickly. So today, I'm going to deal with the nuts and bolts. Uh, in the next series, Michael's going to deal with healthy churches and spiritual leadership. And then finally, we'll have that question and answer time. So here we go. This is going to take about 15, 20 minutes. So let's have a prayer. Almighty God, we give thanks for all those who have accepted the call to leadership in our congregation. We are not a strong congregation if the laity are not strong leaders. And so we pray that that will be the case. Let us work together and let us listen to one another and let our conversations always be constructive and never destructive. Hear our prayers and bless us this day. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> well, the first thing I would just share with you as new officers or officers is let's not neglect this emphasis that we have that is uh, driving the structure of this particular Presbyterian church, and that is we are a five-talent church. In Matthew, we have the parable of the talents. The story is that the father, the owner of the land, goes away for a period of time, and he leaves uh, with those who remain on the land, his managers, uh, a variety of talents. Now, the talents uh, they called them minas. They uh, basically were the currency of the day. And so they leave these talents. And one employee or one manager got five talents, another got two talents, and uh, one manager got one talent. And as many of you know the story, the landowner, the father, uh, the master came back and wanted um, return on his investment. And so the one who was given five uh, gave him five more for a total of 10. Uh, the one who was given two gave two more uh, for a total of four. And the one that was given one just went and dug up his one talent and gave the master back one talent. And the master was not very happy in the parable. The ones who made increase on the investment were blessed. The one who did not was thrown out. It is a stark parable and an important parable um, and one that we try to own because you think of the resources in terms of um, our talent pool at First Presbyterian Church, in terms of the gifts that we've been given, in terms of the nature of our members, in terms of the, frankly, the, the, the financial wherewithal of who we are. We are a five-talent church, and if we think of ourselves in any other way, we are going to be in trouble, and we are expected to grow those five talents, and that should be a motivating factor, and so our structure is based on those five talents. Our five talents basically are these. 
They are discipleship, fellowship, hospitality, mission, and worship. Those are the five things that we find that Jesus is constantly doing. It's the five things that the disciples were doing after Pentecost in Acts 2. They were engaged in these five acts. And everything else supports these five ministries or these five talents. And so that's kind of how we structured it. So again, discipleship, fellowship, hospitality, mission, and worship, music, and arts. So these are our five talents. Now they are supported by our pillar committees. That's your nominating committee. We have to have human resources. Uh, our personnel committee, again, we have to have paid staff. Um, and we also have our trustees. We have our deacons. We have others who are supportive of the role of making sure that all these things happen. And so uh, buildings and grounds, they are our pillar committees that allow the other five to do their task of ministry. So that's how we're structured, and, and that's how we like to focus. Now, you're going to see the buttons that we have created, and I'm going to do a little screen share here with you. This uh, is basically, um, if I can find the right thing, okay, desktop. Um, this basically uh, is uh, the training manual that we used uh, if we were going to meet together, this is what we'd use. And you see this button that we have, and it is up till now. Up till now is our three-word response to the negative seven-word response that is often said at churches. Most of us know those seven words. We've never done it like that before. Seven deadly words. We've never done it like that before. We live in a new time. We never, in, in my lifetime, never had a pandemic. Uh, in 2004, we never got hit by a hurricane. Um, in uh, 2008, we never had the downturn of the economy so bad as it was at that time, at least during my tenure. There are a lot of up, uh, we've never done it like that before. Uh, we've never uh, made a lot of decisions we've never made before because we're in a different time. And so our three word response is, up till now. Up till now, there are new opportunities and new ways to make decisions. And I believe it's going to be the new norm up till now. Now, we don't pull the rug out of those who got us to the dance. Uh, my mother was always telling me, make sure that you uh, take care of that person that you took to the dance. You stay with them. And so we stay with those that got us where we are. We're the inheritors of their good works. Yet in this time in which we live, when things are changing so much, up till now is really a, a critical idea. Um, and it really comes from throughout scripture. And again, I would quote from Matthew 5. Um, it, the whole chapter is based on this uh, dialogue. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, or Jesus would maybe say today, up till now, you have heard. But now I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. So even, even Jesus kind of gives us that concept. You've heard it said this. This is the way we've always done it up till now. That, that really is big language. It drives us, and it's, I think, very helpful, while at the same time honoring the great work that has come before us. Next, that I think is really important to what we do. We have to have vision. Everybody has to have some vision. It may not be the biggest vision in the world, but you have to have some idea of where you would like things to go, what kind of church you would like to be a part of, what has God placed before us that we need to take advantage of. So we have to have vision. It's Proverbs 29, 18 in the King James Version that says, without vision, the people perish. I love that parable. I mean, yeah, that, that proverb. It's a, it's a beautiful proverb. But there's one in Christian ministry that is very similar to that. Without vision, people will go to a different parish. That's really important for us to know. 
we have to have some vision so that we can attract people, so that we can welcome people in, so that we can be exciting, so that we can be relevant, so that we're not just so insular in our own activity that we're not reaching out to the world. So that's critical to who we are as leaders. We have to have vision and we ask that of you. Our conversations with one another should be constructive and not destructive. It's really important. We're going to disagree on many issues. That's fine. And we can disagree. But we've got to make sure we use our disagreements for growth to improve the ideas that we originally had. And that's the way good dialogue and discourse should go. It should move us into a better place than we were before. I uh, listened to a podcast the last few days and the speakers uh, has a wonderful concept. They say, you know, listening to each other should be like being on a climbing wall. We, we're able to listen and maybe we're able to find new routes that we're able to reach to in order to climb a wall. Uh, conversation should never be a cage match in which my victory is more important than anything else. It's not about victory. It's about progress. It's about growth. It's about being constructive. And that's what our conversation should be. We're not going to agree on everything. Nobody does, nor should we. But our disagreements should build us up as a body of Christ. So I want to walk through with you these uh, um, ideas in this little booklet. Uh, hopefully by now I've sent this booklet to you and you're able to kind of look through it. A couple of things we ask that you fill in. Um, and uh, so here's the agenda that if we were there together, um, you know, what are some facts about yourself? Maybe you should write those down yourself. Have you served as an officer before? What was that like? How did you feel about it? Um, what's your experience been in churches? Why did you accept to become an officer now? And, you know, we do pray. It's, it's well, you know, somebody asked me and I felt guilty about it. Hopefully that's not the reason you became an officer. Hopefully you had a calling from God, a sense that God wants you to do something meaningful in this parish. And then what is one or more things that uh, you need to know for your service as an officer, for it to be a meaningful experience for you? What are, what are ways we can help you? So write those down and during our, our Q&A time, we'll look at those. Um, our officers are here. Uh, hopefully you have this little booklet as well. These are uh, your officers. The asterisks are those who are serving as uh, trustees. Again, uh, we try to have six trustees from the active session. The reason that is, is that they become the majority votes on trustees. Session has the final word. Session is the policy making board of the church. They have delegated to the trustees certain um, responsibilities for finance and budgetary process and uh, facility care that if we tried to take care of in our session meetings, it would take forever. So the trustees do a great job and are to be very much trusted because they are of our own. We have three at-large uh, trustees and they are very, very important. Um, and uh, that is what's um, uh, kind of driving us as a church. You have the deacons there. Um, I would share with you that um, Steve Harrison will be filling Bob Satola's term. I see that that's still there on the sheet. That, that is not correct. Uh, Steve Harrison will be the uh, president of the trustees, and we're thankful for his service. In this next little section there, uh, you see when the different committees meet, um, it is up to each committee to decide the best time for them to meet. So for example, hospitality at this point is supposed to meet at 4 p.m. I'm not so sure that's the best time for us. Um, we need to see if there's an issue of why that's so late uh, because we have some members who live at the estates and that just may not be a good time for their schedule. Um, and, and if you have folks who are working, an afternoon time may not be good for their schedule. So we need to look at who's on our committee and we need to plan appropriately. So 
here are the list of the committees. There's the list of the pillar teams. I've shown you that. We talked about that. Um, and uh, it's not moving forward. Why is it not moving forward? There we go. Uh, so there's your trustee class. This is just kind of the responsibility of elders. I'm going to leave that for you to read. Uh, responsibility of the diaconate. Here are some ministry uh, possibilities and opportunities. Um, write some of the things that have been best practices at other faith communities you've been a part of. What are things that we probably could do that we're not doing? Um, there is always room to upgrade, and we want you to know that. Always room to upgrade, and we need your help for that. God didn't call you to be an officer of this church just so that we can be the same church three years from now. So uh, there's always room for upgrade. So here's kind of what I wanted to go over with you, just some of the nuts and bolts. And I, I hope you can see this. Whoops. Hope you can see this okay. Um, first, committee goals and responsibility. Uh, we do ask that committee set their own vision and their own goals. What do they want to accomplish in the coming year? So, for example, I'm going to a worship committee meeting uh, in just a few minutes. One of the things they've got to do, they've got to make some decisions on our musical equipment. We need to um, take care of some of our equipment, particularly the bells. They need to be refurnished. So they're going to make some goals there. There may be some attendance goals. There may be some, um, you know, music goals, uh, hospitality. Uh, they're responsible for new member care. So there may be some number goals and how many people we want to join the church. So whatever goals and vision your committee is establishing, establish some. They can be stretch goals. Maybe we don't reach them, but we've stretched out there trying to, or they can be very uh, practical objectives that we are looking to achieve. Um, ministry teams are to elect their own leaders when not assigned. You do not have to be uh, an active elder to chair a talent team. Not every elder is uh, called to be an elder just so that they can chair a committee. Uh, talent committees and teams are to be adequately staffed with members of the church. We have had times where it seems like there are more staff members at a committee meeting than members of the church, and that's usually not a healthy thing. So we want to make sure that we have a, a good, healthy uh, group of uh, members on each committee. Talent committees have authority to spend their budget. With sensitivity to the broader church and, and where we are financially, um, but you have respons responsibility and authority to spend your budgets. That's, that's why we've been given a budget. Talent committees and teams are to send minutes, meeting minutes to the church office in a timely manner. We hope that's no more than two to three days following the previous meeting. We need to make sure that we get all of these minutes together. We put them in a session packet so that the session can uh, have access to them. We need those well ahead of the session meeting so that they can read them. So it is very important that we get those minutes in. And today, uh, with the ability to video the meeting, uh, record the meeting, uh, that's very helpful. It's just real important, whoever's taking minutes, you don't have to write down every discussion. It's really about action items. It's about the time. It's about making sure your minutes are approved. It's about making sure action items are, you know, moved uh, and, and sec moved, seconded and approved. Uh, and that's all acknowledged. So, it doesn't have to be the biggest document in the world, uh, but it has to give us guidance. Um, talent committees are to communicate their action items to the church office for inclusion in the session agenda. Um, we will be giving everyone uh, kind of a, a template of how we would like to have the minutes kind of laid out in an outline. That way it's really clear what the action item going to session is. is. Uh, again, real quick, an action item is what needs to be voted on or approved by session or action taken by section. There are some discussion items if we're not ready to take action on something, but it's really important that we have a conversation. Those can be taken to session, but they're not action items. They're just discussion items. Those need to be acknowledged. Um, 
talent committees and teams are to be creative and self-directed. You have authority. God called you. Make some decisions. If, if decisions aren't right, we can change them. Um, but no decision is worse than no decision. So feel free to make decisions. Committees are to confirm their meeting times and whether or not they meet, they acknowledge that uh, by contacting the church office. Uh, saying we did not meet, that, is, they, that in essence are your minutes for that, that month. We did not meet. Um, talent uh, committees are to establish a yearly calendar identifying their need for room reservations, uh, minute for missions, dates on the calendar. It's really important that in one of your first meetings, you kind of look at the year in total. There are going to be some people who have been on the committee. If you're new to the committee, they've been on. They kind of know what a year looks like. Look at that. Mark it down. Write it down. Figure out when you do need those minute for missions, let's say, ahead of uh, some special offerings. You may need them a couple of weeks ahead of that special offering. You don't want to wait to the day of the special offering. So that's what I would encourage you. Um, and then finally, uh, talent committees and teams are asked to plan for continuity for their committee or team. So there is a smooth and effective transition for the following year. So keep recruiting, keep getting people. When new members join the church, see if their talent matches what you're trying to accomplish. And that will be really important. Okay, over here, what can you expect from your, your staff at First Presbyterian Church? Uh, I would just say, as far as me, um, you should know that uh, the buck stops with us. Um, you have authority. You have been called by God to bring forth your own ideas. Uh, use your authority. God called you, and we will have your back. We will make sure that you're supported. Okay, so own that. Second, you are called, so you are responsible. The church must move forward. Uh, you are responsible and accountable. That's why you took leadership. The motto of our leadership should be the same as Walt Disney. He had a great, great concept. Keep moving forward. Always moving forward. The Apostle Paul said, I am always seeking to advance the gospel. We, we have to move forward. We have to grow. Uh, sometimes we're not quite sure where we're going, but we have to be out there. Um, Abraham was justified as being righteous, not because he stayed in Ur, but because he left, because he went. And so we are to go uh, where God leads. Um, already talked about vision. You're to have vision. You are called to lead. So lead. Um, we're, we're a church. We want to be led. Um, remember, there's a difference between daydreamers and visionaries. Daydreamers dream and never realize the dream. Visionaries act and realize the vision. And that's what we need to be about. Just say no to the status quo. I think we've hit on that enough. Um, but you get the idea. Uh, a new day is dawned and we need to be open to new ideas. So that's okay. Um, let me move out of the way here. A couple of things on organization for you and your committee. Plan early. Um, that's always helpful. Uh, most of you know me, and uh, uh, plan early is like me calling the kettle black. Um, but plan early. It always helps. Uh, remind the pastors of your needs, and if you need to remind them again, remind them again. If you need to remind them again, remind them again you get the idea. The squeaky officer gets the attention. No problem. Um, take charge. Be a leader. Don't lord over people, but, you know, try some new things. Be a leader. Do what you need to do. Have a broad view of your eldership and your deacon service. Um, in my opinion, you're not called to just go to meetings and make policy. You're not just called to be an elder so you can have a nice name tag and people uh, like to greet you in the marketplace. You're an elder so that when you're in the marketplace, you're greeting them. You're taking care of them. You're serving them. Uh, if we are following Christ and Christ said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. Uh, if we're going to follow him, that's what we do. So the broad vision of our leadership really is out there in the world. And that's important. Um, have thick skin. 
I might get you mad at me sometime, have thick skin. Michael may get you mad at him, have thick skin. Uh, members may get you upset, have thick skin. Um, leaders are magnets for criticism. People will tell you things so that you will tell others. Um, I tell folks this all the time. If someone comes to you and says, um, I've got this big concern, this is really heavy on my heart, I've got this pastoral issue, uh, but whatever you do, don't tell the pastor, that is code language for run as fast as you can and tell the pastor. We have ways of uh, letting folks know uh, or, or getting involved in a situation without letting them know that you were the one that told us. Um, so uh, if you get that kind of information, you, you can confidentially share it with us and should, um, because that really is code language. A couple of things. Why are you magnets for criticism? Because elders and deacons confront sin. Dealing with sin is a frontline activity, and we will receive criticism for doing that. Elders and deacons create change. And that's not comfortable. It's not easy. Uh, but we have to if we're going to grow the church of Jesus Christ. Elders and deacons give answers. And guess what? Sometimes people don't like your answers. Sometimes they don't like it when you tell them you have to love your enemy. I'd rather hate my enemy. People sometimes don't like our answers. And that's okay. Uh, elders and deacons appear strong. And so they can handle the criticism we give them. They can handle our irritation. They can handle our fussiness because they're strong and they can deal with it. Um, uh, that's not necessarily fair, but it happens all the time. People think that they are right to criticize the pastor. They have that right. and They're going to use that right. and They're going to share it with you. And, and maybe they do. That's fine. Um, but at the same time, um, we are serving God as best we can. And the critique goes both ways. Um, just because uh, the pastor or the staff is paid to do their job, we're all Christians. And that part of what we do is never paid. It's our faith belief and our faith life. People think they have a duty to criticize elders and deacons. Some people feel they have an obligation to say the session's not doing this or the doc and it didn't do that. Um, get their name and call them to be an elder next time. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, but, you know, they, they will. You will receive criticism based on the office you hold. That's absolutely fine. Have some thick skin and be ready to handle the criticism. Take the criticism as information that will help you if you take it to help you make better decisions and share with staff better ideas and to help them improve themselves so that we can be the church that we believe we should be. Um, I would also remind you as officers that you um, uh, should make sure that you're in a position to be devoted to scripture. Um, and then I, I miss six, pray for each other. Don't neglect the power of prayer. All right. Uh, this whole next section are the expectations. If you can satisfy all these things, uh, God bless you. But these are kind of what we're asked to do. Um, you are asked to go to Presbytery one time at least during your tenure. There are quarterly meetings right now. There's Zoom meetings. They're a little easier on our time and energy. Um, but when they open up, we're still asking you to serve as a representative of our church to Presbytery. Presbytery is, um, offices are in Orlando, but the region is all of Central Florida. We are on the Southern East portion of our Presbytery, uh, Okeechobee and Sebring to the West, uh, Lake County up to the North and Brevard County um, also to the Northeast. So that's our General Presbytery. Our Senate is the Senate of uh, the South Atlantic. That is Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. And then General Assembly is our high to, highest judicatory. But you need to think of it inverted. What's the most important institution in the church? The local church. Then they're supported by the Presbytery. The Presbytery is supported by the session, I mean, the, the Senate. And then the Senate is supported by the General Assembly. So we can all get our our tasks done. Um, 
Remember this, a great commitment to the great command, commandment will always grow a great church. The great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, your neighbors, yourself. The great commission, um, go, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. When we focus on these two, the commandment and the commission, we will grow a great church. I love that phrase. Um, I will share with you during the question and answer this kind of uh, state of the church. Uh, we're in a really healthy place. We're in a good place, and we should celebrate that. Again, First Presbyterian Church, number one up here on the right-hand column on page 19. First Presbyterian Church is a five-talent church, not a two-talent church, not a one-talent church, a five-talent church. We are to return uh, God's investment uh, uh, appropriately. Uh, First Presbyterian uh, is uh, a blessing, and we are meant to bless others. We are a blessing, and we are meant to be a blessing. Uh, First Presbyterian Church um, uh, has great opportunity in facing change. Change should not be scary for us. There are just so many great opportunities for us. Uh, for First Presbyterian Church, it's not a question of if, but when we grow. We have to grow. We need to grow the body of Jesus Christ. Our world needs it. And so we need faithful, rational, engaged, loving, reformed Christians running all over the place. So that's what we want to do. Visionary leaders know that people always come before programs. This is critical. People always come before programs. I get a lot of grief sometimes when I invite people to dinner when, when the, the count has already been cut off. It's already been cut off. We don't have enough food for everyone. Still going to invite them because people come before programs. And somebody can give up a plate of food. I don't care. But um, people come before programs. Um, everyone is a child of God, everyone, even those we don't like. We have to love them, care for them, because they're a child of God. Those who have much, much is expected, and that's us as officers of this church. So never give up, keep up the good work, and be engaged. Remember our mission statement from way back when, I think it's still very appropriate, only six words only six words, and they're so interchangeable, it's unbelievable. Building faith, changing lives, sharing Christ. We should memorize that. It should roll off our tongue, and we should be able to know that all the time. All right, I have to run to a worship committee meeting, but God bless, and hope this is helpful. Read over that document, and then watch Michael's video, and then after that, we'll have the question and answer uh, series. So, Anyway, God bless. Thank you so much. And thank you for serving. And thank you for making this church just such a lovely, lovely community of faith. May God bless. Bye-bye.